We're headed east to work and play. That's next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. Every year, tens of thousands of people come to Franklin Park Conservatory, just east of downtown, to escape everyday life. Even 150 years ago, the east side was seen as a getaway. Here's the story of how the conservatory blossomed as a thriving, growing city kept pushing east. Franklin Park, which had originally been set up as the home of the Franklin County Agricultural Society, later will become the state fairgrounds and then a public park. At the end of the Victorian era, there was a city beautiful movement and it was a movement to beautify cities and urban areas by creating parks. And so Columbus instituted several parks throughout the entire metropolitan area, including Franklin Park. The historic John F. Wolfe Palm House was constructed in 1895, and it was inspired by the buildings at the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. It was reputed originally to have been brought down here how one does not know, from the Columbian Exposition. In fact, it wasn't. It was built here. The features were a beautiful lake, which is west of the Palm House, where we have the Mallway today. And then there's a 1.2 mile walking path that people use today for exercise and walking their dogs. And that was actually a driving track. So people came down for a leisurely drive, and there was also automobile racing. And since then, the park has been a popular destination. In 1992, the city decides for the 500th anniversary celebration of Christopher Columbus landing in the New World, and we are the largest city in the nation named for Christopher Columbus, that they're going to invite this large floral exhibit to come here called Ameriflora. It was the first horticulturally themed exposition in North America, and the goal was to bring people here from all over the United States and beyond to view displays that were typical of all of the major cultures in the world. The historic Palm House was renovated for Ameriflora and a $14 million expansion was undertaken to create numerous new structures to house exotic biomes. So we built uh, the Himalayan biome, a rainforest, a desert, and a Pacific Island water garden, which are still here today. And then the park, all 88 acres, were part of the Ameriflora Festival. Amira Flores' vision, I think, was to be a very, very grand event. President and First Lady Barbara Bush came to kick it off, and it saw over two million people in attendance, so it was, it was huge. Amira Flora brought with it a lot of excitement and a lot of people to our community. It brought some money to rehab the houses around the park. It gave us a place in national history because it was so famous for a short period of time. So they closed the park for an entire year, 1991. 
off from the community, put a fence up, tell the entire community you can't go there, you can't use the park anymore. And then in 1992, they open it back up, they, they charge admission to everybody because it's now this large ex exhibition space. It was really hard that it was fenced off for a while. It was the community's park and they couldn't walk in it without paying to get in it. So um, there, there was a lot of controversy around it during the time it was Ameriflora. I remember a family that we knew well were just really adamantly against the park being used for Ameriflora. My mother was on a committee for it, and her perspective was it was going to make a big difference for the community. So I think that those two views of two people who were neighbors and who knew each other well it sort of epitomizes the conflict. And many people did feel that they were being marginalized. That was the beginning of more attention that was more vocal and that you could uh, see uh, a lot of the energy and the resentment of uh, persons in terms of how that was handled. I think the people who were planning it might have been a little surprised by that, but conservatory staff actually went out into the neighborhoods and talked with everyone and assured them that it was still their park and then even did landscaping in the yards of all of the houses surrounding the park. Really through time what I have discovered is things do really work themselves out. Communities do really come together. Well, I think Ameriflora probably has mixed reviews in terms of its success. But I think in hindsight, it was calling attention to a park that had long been neglected. People became aware that the neighborhood really was uh, quite nice. Some of the good things that did come out of it when they added all of the different biospheres around it. And it also cleaned up the park a little bit because they added the waterfalls and, and the pergolas and the mallway garden. And the conservatory got a kickstart at that point. After Ameriflora was over, the conservatory staff continued to go out into the neighborhoods and talk with people and build friendships. And that actually became the very beginning of what has grown into a very vibrant community gardening program called Growing to Green. And over the years since, the conservatory has helped to found and help thrive over 200 community gardens. So I think it was the, the mending fences and the rebuilding of the relationships here locally around the park that taught us that that relationship and that sharing of expertise was really important to our neighbors and that it became really impactful. It's a fabulous asset for those of us who live here. It's beautiful, it's essentially safe, it's well cared for, and the neighborhood looks out for it. It is a true urban park, and the conservatory has kept it going and kept it beautiful and made it kind of a jewel in the city of Columbus. We're driving with Darby again this week, and the destination is the unique neighborhood that grew up alongside Franklin Park Conservatory. The community around Franklin Park began to grow after about 1890. It really was out on the country until then, but people realized living around the park would be a good place to be. So they started building houses and styles of the time between 1890 and about 1920, and uh, much of that character still remains. I would like to show you some of the houses still standing that are exemplary of the, the styles that were used uh, in this period. The neighborhood we're going to, a couple of houses there are examples of the styles in which people built, what are called eclectic styles uh, and revival styles, where people took examples of architecture from the past and designed it into new buildings, often combining two different styles. And this particular building has hallmarks of Spanish colonial revival, You're thinking of the adobe architecture of the southwestern United States. That's why it has a stucco exterior finish, but it also combines elements of the craftsman style, an early 20th century style that played up the craftsmanship of building houses. That's why you'll see the exposed wooden elements, uh, the overhanging eaves and brackets and things like that, showing the artistry that goes into working with wood. And it's been combined very successfully in this sort of blended style 
This next building on Franklin Park South is an example of colonial revival style, but derived from American colonial architecture. Uh, it, it embodies features from early American architecture, uh, but is another example of a solid, middle-class, uh, pleasant place to live on a really nice park. Now I'd like to take you to Franklin Park, to a part of the park that's really special. We're in the community garden area of Franklin Park right now, at the southeast corner of the park. This was not an original feature of Franklin Park. It was begun after the Ameriflora exhibition in 1992. As a result of that, the American Community Garden Association moved to Franklin Park to Columbus from New York City and now occupy the former caretaker's residence. So this is a training area for uh, teaching people how to garden. There are cooking sessions, uh, all relating to people preparing their own food. Uh, another benefit for the community and another aspect of the fact that this is a community park intended not only for the city at large, but especially for the people who live around it. We've been doing Columbus neighborhoods in one form or another since 2010, and we've learned there's one constant among all of our neighborhoods, and that's change. Our secret to finding out how neighborhoods evolve is to visit long-established restaurants like Jumbo's Sub Shop in Whitehall. We're in Whitehall at Jumbo's Sub Shop. It's an icon in the community where police officers and students alike can grab crunchy munchies and hot subs. There are roast beef, BLT, and vegetarian subs, plus ham or chicken gyros, old-style pizza, and baklava for dessert. Whitehall Mayor Kim Maggard is our lunch date today, and we're talking about the character and challenges of living on the east side of Columbus. Well, Mayor Maggard, um, it was great to be able to talk to you today. Um, tell me a little bit about Whitehall. What is this city's claim to fame? One of the things that we're really known for is the fact that we really are a military city because we have DSCC within our borders. And uh, during World War I, we were making uniforms for all the soldiers in World War I. And then we started becoming a supply uh, depot for the Army. You said you have about 19,000 uh, population yes. here. Does that make this a big town or a small city? I think it makes us a big town because when you talk about a town versus a city, a town seems like everybody knows everybody else. And we also kind of all know each other's business. <laughs> and that's, sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes not so good. But that's okay. We're all family here. You also are seeing more diversity in your schools yes. now, is that right? Oh, yes. Tell me about what kind of diversity you're getting mm -hmm. and how that's going to affect the future of Whitehall. Well, for one thing, I'd just like to say diversity uh, I think is a road to success. Uh, in Whitehall, Caucasian, that's, that's the majority, but then our uh, African American, also our Hispanic, and then we get down to Ethiopian, Somalian, and more Eastern type European countries such as Russia. What my children have told me, I have four children, they all graduated from Whitehall City Schools, and they've gone out and had to do what they, you know, their careers and all this, and they say, I'm so glad, Mom, that we went to a diverse school because I, I deal with all sorts of people, Mom, and this has helped me to learn that I, I look at people and accept them for what they are because that's the way I grew up, and I don't know any difference, and, the, and they said, Mom, I'm so happy that we grew up here. So I think being around other people, being exposed constantly to new ideas and new ways of doing things and the way that people talk can only help us as we grow older and prepare us for the future. Well, would you like to talk about the future a little bit of Whitehall? Sure. All right. Let's we'll talk about the future of Whitehall. All right, we're going to talk about that. Well, we are getting uh, two new uh, school resource officers in the schools, which is phenomenal because this will actually let the police have their ear to the ground a little bit more about mm. what youth really need. We're going to be also getting two canine units. Really? And yes, we do have a you know addiction problem in our community. I think a lot of communities do. And opiate addiction is, is very bad. So we can get those dogs in and that will help us find some of the, the illegal drugs. And they're a great 
a resource, I think, to bridging gaps with people. Also, we're doing a lot of economic development, too. Wasserstrom is moving their headquarters from Columbus to Whitehall. Yeah. Heartland Bank is moving their headquarters from Gahanna to Whitehall. Ooh. Uh, so those are some big wins for us. And so we're actively going after other businesses. And you know why we can do that? Why? Because we're a big town. <laughs> we can build those relationships, not right. only with businesses, but with our residents. So I, I think that we've got a great jump on the future. Well, fantastic. It's really been a pleasure talking to you about all of this. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And the last thing we're going to do, you're going to have some of that baklava. All right. I can't eat it because I'm allergic. But well, I just might have to have your piece as I well. I think you're going to have to. All right. I'm going to try this. Oh, it looks wonderful. Mary, you did it again. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Delicious. Our stories document how neighborhoods and communities change. A great example is even further east. It's an area that's transitioned many times, from a big swamp to a canal system feeder lake, then an amusement park, to what some today call the playground of Ohio, and you know it as Buckeye Lake. Buckeye Lake exists where it is and what it is because of the Ohio Canal. It was a big swamp. Governor Morrow caught canal fever in Ohio. And when he starts looking at building a canal system in Ohio after New York had built the Erie Canal, then Ohio starts to say, hell, hey, you know, if we can get to Lake Erie by water, then we can get the East Coast markets. When they're starting to build the canal, the key ingredient you've got to have is water. And all of a sudden, the Buffalo Swamp became important because it sits on one of the high points in Ohio. What they wanted to do was fill these reservoirs so that the water would flow into the canal systems. To create the Licking Reservoir, they had to build a dam about four miles along the, the west and north side of this swamp. If a town was lucky enough to have a lock, when boats had to stop, then people would get off, you'd have restaurants, you had all this sort of stuff would spring up. You know, you found warehouses that farmers could ship in and out from there. You found farriers that took care of the animals. You found hotels. And the other thing that you had, if you had a lock, you also had moving water, so you had water power. So you start to see mills develop along the canal. We had two locks. We had the Minthorn lock and the deep cut lock. Henry Minthorn must have been a great entrepreneur because he actually probably saw what was happening. Henry put a hotel up and he had a little grocery store and he had some rooms because he saw all these people coming. This was the freeway system of its day. You can't underestimate what the canal system meant for an area like Buckeye Lake. All over Ohio, this is the first time you start to see cities grow up. This is the first big growth spurt in Ohio. The canal boat went four miles an hour, moving pretty slow, and then came the train. And out here we had what they called the inner urban, which was an electric train. The inner urban brought thousands and thousands of day trippers out here, starting in the early 1900s. It was 10 cents to get on the inner urban, and it went 70 miles an hour. So when you think of the people that were going four miles an hour, versus 70. You could be out here in 30 minutes. It became a, a great place to be. People started to go, hey, there's this lake over there. It's full of fish. It's peaceful. So the people were coming out, and they were just kind of resting by the shore, you know, getting air, bringing their picnic lunch. And the traction company said, whoa, we need something for these people to do. Buckeye Lake was built by the uh, Interurban Company. The idea was to generate traffic to get people to ride the cars and pay their fares. You start to see, you know, the, the games and things start to show up. You start to see the ride show up. And then it was blown down by a cyclone, which you hardly ever hear that word anymore, in 1927. And that's when they built the park that most people remember today. We moved out here in 1947. I was 14 years old, went to work right away in the park. <laughs> My first job was setting up stuffed cats for a man that had a game where you threw a ball and knocked the cats off of the shelf. 
and I went and set the cats back up. My sister owned Kitty Land, and she had eight rides, little boat rides and Ferris wheels. And then when the park would close at night, of course, we had the Pink Elephant Nightclub there. We had the Crystal Ballroom, it was called. And you had a balcony, you could go out and look down on the swimming pool. And all the big bands came, all of them. The music, the people, the excitement, the whole atmosphere. The best time of my life. We had at one time 15 hotels around Buckeye Lake. Now they weren't what we think of today. They didn't have chocolates and things like that. But they were large structures with maybe 20, 25 rooms. They'd be a quarter and you'd have a bed and a dresser and some hooks. And then if you wanted a meal, it was 10 cents more. They also had tents. My dad was a conductor of the railroad in Columbus. Why he decided to buy a cottage at Buckeye Lake, I have no idea. I came from a home in town that had water and a bathroom and a bathtub and a toilet to none of that. These were cottages weren't meant for living year round. All the houses that we have here now were the cottages. They were all rented. If you worked at a big factory, Owens, Corning, or Rockwell, or Kaiser, they would rent the park and they would have company picnics. And it brought other groups of people. We had two Ku Klux Klan gatherings here. And the inner urban brought thousands of them here. I think at one point there was like 5,000. At that time they called them cluckers. And it was like a meeting. One of the boys running one of the rides, it would just ran by an old Chevrolet motor. And so when my brothers got on, they said, give us a fast ride. Well, they could because this machine could go as fast as this old Chevrolet motor could go. So it was going round and round and round and, and finally it threw my brother out. His head caught on the railings, one of these squads or anything. So some nice guy picked him up and you know, took him to the hospital. It wasn't safe or it wasn't regulated. With the uh, opening of the park in the spring, they always needed somebody to ride the roller coaster to try it out. Well, I rode that a lot. When I think about it now, I wouldn't do it again the first time for the year because it was never painted and it's just raw wood. Well, almost every structure was wooden. When you look today to compare to some of the other rides, I believe it's part of the reason the park went down because yeah, it wasn't really safe. We had a real fire bug here that was burning everything down. So I was coming home from Columbus and a guy stopped me and said, Donnie, you better hurry home. The park terrace is on fire. And that was our nicest restaurant. It's obvious it was torched. It started just diminishing slowly. The man that inherited the park would not even buy a paintbrush. It just went to pot. For about 10 years, we were just in the paper every day of a big pile of trash, something fell down, just went on and on until finally, and wasn't anything left. Buckeye Lake is still here. It's still you know, a great place to be. There's a lot of people that have a lot of affinity for this place. And it all goes back, had the canal not been built, this wouldn't have happened. I think here in the next couple years, when they get the work done on the dam and people start coming back with their boats, it's gonna boom. It is going to be a boom. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods.
Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine, Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.